Thank you so much for inviting me, and what a, what a great conference. I have to say, uh, for me, it's a great honor to be here because I also have some very old friends which I met again, like uh, uh, John Thompson and uh, Tim Stoner and uh, lots of others here, and I'm really happy to be here. So I would like to share with you, we heard a lot this morning about uh, what, is, what are the challenges we have, and I just, my challenge is now to get to the next slide. Okay, it takes a little while. So I want to talk really about this question. Our cities are expanding, some are shrinking, uh, but the main global trend is that more and more people will live in cities, and actually the only thing what is shrinking is really the environment in the cities, basically the blue and the green. There's almost no space, there's a conflict on space. And uh, this conflict is quite interesting if we look in actually really from an artistic or a landscape uh, perspective on our planet. Before we had our cities, you know, it's quite interesting how actually, to be honest, how this, this you know, long term, this planet is shaped basically by, by water and by the infrastructure uh, of flows of sedimentation of erosions. And I think when we talk about what are cities needing, we can learn a lot from this dynamic, I think. I, I often do experiments with my students to see what do we mean when we talk about resiliency? What, what do we mean about process, about change? Uh, what can we actually learn basically from water, for example? And how can we actually transform that into our city questions? Of course, all cities, in a way, are totally related and rely on water. And we have most beautiful cities always is the waterfront. And I, I just remind you, yesterday we had this wonderful, wonderful boat trip. Uh, fantastic to see London from the Thames. I, actually, I did it the first time. And it's a totally different understanding also about the history and about, about how the city actually did uh, develop. But actually, of course, today this is still very trendy to work with water. We have all kinds of things on very, very bizarre things like here in Singapore on very high rooftop gardens with water where you have a swimming pool and so on. But honestly, most of the places are not looking like this. Most of the places are like, like cramped, like in prisons or like forgotten places places which are back, the backsides of, of places. And, and there's a real big dilemma in a way that we actually changed our environment to, uh, from, a, from a more sort of environment and rural side to a very urban side. And we changed the whole water regime. We, we changed the environment on one side. And we have the question, how can we get back to it? Um, and we know more and more. I mean, this morning we heard a lot about uh, climate change. I have the same graphic, actually, with what we have seen this morning. Uh, we know that the temperature is changing. And what is very specific in this change is that, for example, thunderstorms can happen in one part of the city where in the other part of the city there's no drop coming down. So the extremes are coming up. And the extremes are creating also in our controlled world of cities more and more problems. For example, in Copenhagen, three times on a row, always 100-year storm events. Um, and it's also this morning, I'm so happy that these presentations we have seen, so I, I can actually go quite quickly over this. We have either too much or too little. We have floodings, we have damage, we have droughts, and we have heat, and we have health problems, like 70,000 people died 2003 in Europe. We have dust pollution, we have bad air quality in cities, and they're all related to the water question and the, to the blue-green infrastructure, which we don't have anymore in our cities. This is just uh, two slides I would like to show in this conference. This is intensity of city dynamic or by traffic in Singapore. The next one is the temperature drop at night. You can see this very dense city centers. There's almost no drop down of temperature at night, day and night. So there's no new air coming in. There's stagnant air. And that is a big, big issue. And it's interesting, all matters. And I think what we are in an interesting time now, and I think this, this conference is also about what is architecture. We actually are somehow in a, in a, in a time where this strong ego-driven 
architecture is, I think, over. We are more and more looking how is architecture in the context of the environment. And I will focus on the blue-green for many reasons. It has to do with scales, small scale, big scale, both matter. It has to do with the question, um, can we get rid of the old systems of a combined or separated sewer system, which is basically underground, where we can see there's no space anymore? There might be also different solutions still in the future needed, but we have to do our homework really in the city itself. And what needs to be done is actually that we have resilient spaces where we share space, different functions. If we only occupy one functionality, uh, we, we have lost. But how to bring it together? And when I talk about blue green infrastructure, I just go through some slides. What do we mean by that? I, I will take the example Singapore. Singapore needs every drop which comes down because this is safety for the city. It's the drinking water. At the moment, still, we need 40% by a pipeline coming from the neighbors. So we are totally depending in Singapore from, from, uh, from another country. So what is the future? The future is that our cities have to do their homework right so that we don't rely always on the external outside and just take things from there and give our shit out. Uh, we have to find ways how to do this. And I think just the cities who have the most stress are the most innovative uh, in finding solutions. Blue-green infrastructure, for example, in Singapore is a kind of ABC principle. It's called active, beautiful, and clean. I did work on that for the last almost 10 years. And it really has to do with both, with quantity control and with, uh, with quality and quantity on water. And it can be done in so many different fields. I will just click through some slides about what does it mean in architecture. Because a lot of people say, you know, it cannot be done. But it can be done everywhere. And it has to be done in many, many places, basically decentralized solutions which are combined. So you can do it on the rooftop. You can do a lot of things on the facades. You can work a lot on that. And I just show some examples. I did experiment, for example, in Berlin, Potsdamer Platz, to use all the available rooftops to slow down the process, to harvest it. Or here, together with Woha on buildings, to have different scales of sucking in, evaporating, and uh, slowing down the process. Or on the surface, on the surface on cities also, maybe that's limited in certain areas. But there are lots of opportunities to share, to bring things into a, into a system where we actually slow down, evaporate, and have these cleansing uh, principles. So the technical things are all there. For example, Freiburg, uh, I think uh, Wolf Dasiking will also come tomorrow, a good friend of mine. We, we try to do really a lot of things, every opportunity to use, for example, to suck in, to evaporate, to slow down. Or uh, if we go further to uh, underground solutions, to store, to recycle, for example, here in Berlin, to recycle the water, what we harvest in the city, to treat it can be combined with lots of things. And I think the future is open for much better solutions we cannot imagine even today about gray water recycling and so on. I think that needs also be taken into consideration. I think the experiment on, on Berlin Potsdam and Platz was quite interesting because it really was like a kind of pilot project which gave many cities uh, the courage uh, to do something and to follow this. So here we collect. We use it for toilet flashing. We use it for greenery. And it's, it is a completely artificial system mimicking basically what nature is doing into the city, bringing it back into the city. Well, um, that can also actually have a great impact on the environment and reducing the emission. Because water security in a city is a lot of pumping, is a lot of energy we need for that. Uh, and it is also a question about the beauty, the aesthetics of a city. Water, and yesterday we have seen this with the Thames, it is working with the environment. Water is reflecting light, gives the atmosphere of a city, and is a fantastic artic, artistic uh, element in a city. The same model may be in China for one example, Jianjin, the cultural center. Um, again, harvesting the water, what we got from, from the sky. And using this in a way uh, to have it also as a system for cooling and heating for the buildings. So we have a heat exchanger in the harvested rainwater in this central lake. 
We use it for uh, the opera house, for the town hall, for the library, for a big shopping mall. And it is a combined system where you actually have to bring certain elements together. So that's all the tools we have, and that's all the, the, the opportunities we have. And maybe in the future, uh, cities will have to deal with a very, very interesting way with, um, with systems which are actually interwoven and interconnected. So we know all about this, what can be done. But as someone said before, the big problem is not that we know what we can do. The bigger problem is you know, how to implement it, how to make it possible. So we were actually looking in our uh, work in the last uh, two or three years, how can we actually help that uh, cities and decision makers have better reasons to implement better systems? Because that's a really big problem, a big dilemma, that we don't know what are the benefits, what are the side benefits, what's the value we create. And it's not only, ma it's not only money on, on real estate or so, it has lots of other aspects as well. I will focus on my second part a bit on that. So what is livability and why is livability connected to this question about blue-green? I think uh, there are many, many ways of ranking and ranking livability. And as some is uh, quite interesting, some is also quite questionable. And we know we often measure the standard of living, which are basically the hard facts. But more and more important are actually the soft components, um, which are much more having to do with uh, what is really, what, is, what, ma what matters in our life. How do, we, how do we actually create our life? How do we feel? And it's not so much only the physical conditions. And I would like to uh, focus a bit on that. If we look at cities, uh, we have to be, I think, very smart in a way um, to differentiate on, on, different, on different aspects. I would like to use one model we, used, um, we developed in our livable city lab. On one side, we have all the physical conditions in cities, you know, which is basically the hard facts we have. Um, mobility and so on, and energy and so on. But then it's the social component uh, where we need a kind of sharing and we need to have, for example, no corruption. Cities where have a strong corruption and a very bad system, they, they fail. And, but there's a third thing which is actually the identity which is the driver for also next generation. And I think the example before about this new generation, what are they looking for, values? It has not to do to have a rich car. It has to do very much with other topics, and this is cultural things. And I think you can call it in different ways, but I think that all matters. And if we don't combine that and are aware, we fail. And I take maybe one example out. We also heard this, and that's why I put this example in, about food systems. If we generate uh, very good health food, it will not change. It will not get, a, get away from diabetes. And food is so strong connected to the water question as well. So kids will still not eat in the right way. It is a very much a question about what values do we share, how, what is our education, and, and how are we motivated actually to use the open space, and how does the open space look like? How can we actually get, you know, from sitting always in front of the computers, how can we actually get out? What is the, what is the blue-green structure in the city to motivate us to actually do more than only this? Yeah? And there's a big challenge we have. And actually quite interesting, um, we also had this uh, before the break about health. The psychological effect, this is in Germany, for example, the psychological effect about burnout. Uh, this is really costly. And if we really, really take that all, all in and into account, stress load, mental health, uh, depressions, other problems, it costs a lot of money. And we have to be aware about this. And I think all these questions has, have very much to do with uh, getting people involved. I think John Thompson and I, we had the chance to work in, in one wonderful project in, in, in Moscow, uh, 1991 it was. Uh, involvement of people to let them find the solution together with, uh, with experts is the, is the key point. And the blue-green question is always a public realm. It always has to do for everyone. It's, it's really in the, and it's actually the learning point for democracy. So public involvement in different ways. And I think it has to be artistic. Uh, it has not to be only intellectual. We have to bring our emotions, our feelings on the table as well and in the group. 
and by that we can make a change. And I think really successful projects are not only counting money, they are also counting what is the value from a social and a cultural point to the city. You know, projects I had experienced are very vibrant today, and the maintenance cost for the city is very low because people take care of these projects as well. For example, here in Portland and Oregon. And it's interesting to see, for example, that the stress load, if you go into blue-green infrastructure, is going down. While traffic or pedestrian shopping malls, the stress factor after 10 minutes stress is still very, very high. So I will just show at the end some examples on changed projects, and then I will, will come to a, a last point on our research work, where we just published uh, a, a, from a, a sponsored by the Rumble Foundation. So these are change process of making cities more blue-green, opening and daylighting forgotten streams. What can we do there to bring it up? Because suddenly, this, all this what is underground and where you can actually bring a lot of pollution without anyone seeing it is suddenly in the public realm. So the reaction of people to it is much stronger. And I think there's a very strong social awareness and control about giving priorities to, an, to a better environment. So we work here with bioengineering techniques instead of concrete. Uh, we change the thing from here to here. And by that, we can also cover a lot of rain when it really rains decentralized retention or detention facilities in the sea, like here in Singapore, where we have an average per year of two and a half meters rainfall. And when the rain is gone, this is a resilient place which is for people again. So overlapping. So the future, I think, in cities will be that we have to get out of the silos. We have to bring different functions on the same spot together. There's a big discussion about security. Is water dangerous? How can we behave right? What kind of, what kind of legal sort of uh, regulations do we need? Um, is it driven by, by, by uh, being afraid and keeping everything uh, away? Or is it a point where we have to, to work with risks and to live with risks? Well, um, we did a research work finally here I would like to mention is uh, here on, on four universities where we were looking very much in the question, you know, successful projects and unsuccessful projects around the world. Uh, what were the main components? We made case studies uh, between America and Europe and, uh, and Asia, and we, we looked into possibilities and failures of projects. And one of the projects our team is working for uh, right now is the Cloudburst project for Copenhagen. We try to get all the rainwater, all the floodings we had, and to keep the, the water actually in the city. And that needs a very, very clear, distinguished um, uh, process also. We were looking at uh, the drivers of change, uh, the enabling conditions, and the constraining conditions, and so on. And we figured out in all the projects, when we talk about values and about capital building, we have to take so many different forms of capital into our consideration. It's not only real estate. It's, for example, the symbolic capital of a city. Um, the symbolic capital, for example, for Singapore is that Singapore is a city within gardens and waters. It's blue-green infrastructure, and that makes the city the symbolic capital as a driver to get people to bring their headquarters to Singapore, or to have also young people to be proud about a city. They have, of course, lots of other problems, uh, but it is certainly an extremely important point. We did talk about many other capital forms, so I will not go too deep into this. We also have found some very important recommendations, and I would just like to mention some of them. Uh, cities who have a very strong vision uh, and have a, it, it's not necessarily to have a master plan, because I think a master plan is even a very old-fashioned word. It's the master. It's, by the way, we should have much more women in, uh, on, on such a conference. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm almost a bit ashamed that I'm a man as, at the end of this morning. Only man's here. So uh, it needs actually a vision which is driven by the community, and actually it is very important that we have both top-down and bottom-up and find new ways, but we need a strategic vision where we want to go to. And we, it must be flexible so that it can be informed. 
This afternoon, uh, Simon Price of our team will talk about this project here in Copenhagen, which is a new, uh, a new development, what uh, Copenhagen will do. Uh, and it's like that from every place, there's only five minutes to get a public transportation system to make it very difficult for cars to drive and to give many reasons not to take a car. Uh, and that needs a consensus in the society, of course. Um, or another point, we need a cultural capacity which is a kind of common ground in our society. It is not enough that we as experts, planners, have the understanding we have to get the people actually on board. And there must be like a, like a common ground about sharing values, making decisions. And that is always a process. Our democracies need a process of steps, of a step approach. And we have to get everyone on board. We also have to have dialogues. So in, Singapore, uh, in Copenhagen, this is actually the case. We use uh, a lot of public spaces where people actually have to agree. And they have to accept that we have controlled floodings in the streets even. When there's a 100-year storm event that is occupied by water. Uh, you know, to do something like this, we know in Hamburg we tried to do the same. It was too abstract, so it, we were not able to do this. Structural capacity, we mentioned this a lot. We have to bring the different disciplines together in a kind of round table discussion to make really livable cities. And um, opportunities, it is often the opportunities where something is going wrong. These are the best opportunities to make a change. So if we have a flooding in a city, we only have a half a year to react politically to make a change. After half a year, it's gone because it's business as usual. And we have to have the concept already before that. Um, and there are many opportunities, like playgrounds, which can be flooded, controlled, and then can be empty. And of course, skills and knowledge is also something we have to create. In Singapore, I did build up with the, with the government a kind of program where all planners actually get a kind of uh, training program. And they have to do this uh, about water and about uh, the blue-green environment, how to implement it. Without that, they, they get no planning permission. Skills and knowledge is extremely important. And I will actually come to the end. When we, when we, do, when we bring blue-green blue infrastructure into cities, it can also be cheaper. Uh, and we can also work in a way that suddenly these shared spaces are much more attractive for people. Because I think uh, this generation already and the next generation, where we lost so much the environment, we, we love to be uh, back again connected. The biophilia effect, for example, is uh, discussed and, and, and uh, a lot of research is done on that. Final uh, slides here. I'm working at the moment also with our team in, in, uh, called uh, in, in India, for example, in cities which have a very, very poor water system. And also there, it is so important to bring blue-green in, in the right way, not to have only high-tech solutions which cannot be handled in these countries. And also, we have to create this cultural aspect to explain you know, what's happening. Often in our planning tools, we use simple drawings and sketches to, to learn you know, what, what is actually a change process and what kind of values. And then we can actually implement better things. So I, I come to the end and say leadership, financing, our good arguments are finally needed uh, to make an impact and to make a change. So to bring blue-green back into our cities. Thank you. Thank you.